Hello and welcome to the A-List Education webinar series for students, parents, and educators. Thank you everybody for joining us today. Um, we're ready to get started. My name is Anthony Sarchapone from A-List Education. And each week we discuss news and topics affecting student learning in this exceptionally challenging academic year. Uh, during the webinar, we encourage you to ask your questions. Uh, you'll see a Q&A bubble at the bottom of your screen. If you could let us know who you are, uh, where you're from, you're a parent, you're a student, you're an educator, um, and our, pal our panelists will address your questions uh, either during the webinar or at the end of the webinar. Uh, so in fact, go ahead into that little Q&A bubble right now, say hi, where you're from, um, that, that way we know it's working and um, we can def when it comes time for a question and answer, we can answer your questions. This webinar series, <clears throat> I think all the topics in this webinar series can be summed up in one question, and that is, what is the new normal in education and how can we adapt to it? Specifically tonight, with the sudden change in remote learning and the abrupt push out of structured learning environments and their inherent support networks, how can teachers and families support children with special learning needs, such as ADHD. Most of you attending today are familiar with our speaker, Dr. Ned Hallowell. He is a national thought leader, New York Times bestselling author, doctor, advocate, and speaker on ADHD. Uh, Dr. Hallowell will be discussing the challenges students with ADHD face with remote learnings and tactics to help us support them. How educators, families, and education advocates and actively support students is central to the mission of A-List Education. So I wanna welcome Namita Eip, our VP of Institutional Partnerships. She's also on the webinar. And Dr. Ned Hallowell, and I'll turn it over to you, Dr. Hallowell. Welcome, Dr. Hallowell. Well, thank you, Anthony. And um, they can see me, is that correct, Anthony? The participants can see me? Yes. So, so they, they see my hair is, is extremely long. This is, this is how many weeks without a haircut. But yes. good news, I get blessed relief on Saturday. I have, I have found a professional person who can cut my hair. Otherwise, it, it was going to be given over to my wife or my daughter, and I would not have wanted to see those results. So right. Wherever, wherever you are, I hope your hair is, is soon to be cut, and I hope you're uh, managing this... Uh, this season uh, adroitly, you know, it, it, it is difficult. I'll be trying tonight to give you some ideas, but I thought I'd begin with a question that was emailed to us, oh, a few days ago, that I think uh, sets the stage pretty eloquently uh, and, and describes the problem that I think uh, uh, most of you who tuned in for this webinar are dealing with. So not to minimize the problem, I'll let this mom describe it. My observation is my middle school child's remote learning taxes her executive function beyond her capabilities. Managing the online resources, clicking here, clicking there, reading and rereading directions and gathering materials, oi! I took over many of these preparatory tasks for her and found that just for one class, merely getting ready required over an hour. And that's before even starting any actual learning or work. I also observed that any extrinsic joy she would have received from working with classmates or laughing at teachers' jokes was now removed. All class video conferences were chaotic and didn't provide easy Q&A or informal dialogue. Asking a question was painfully public and so was receiving help if it came at all. Doing assignments felt pointless as feedback and encouragement were not well conveyed in this setup, just grades. Essentially, the experience has been a motivational, emotional, and self-regulatory disaster. By the way, if you hear noise outside, I'm sitting in my dining room and I have to have the windows open because the air conditioning has gone off and I, I don't wanna suffocate. She goes on to say, my question, how can we address this with a school that is likely strained beyond its typical capacity to assist kids with special needs? I fully anticipate schools will continue this way into the fall. We are seriously considering homeschooling in order to avoid the stress and constantly feeling left behind, unsupported, and merely assigned work to check a box and get a grade. 
Well, she put it well, don't you think? Uh, so, so what do we do? Well, I, I, have, uh, I have various experts that I can call on, and, and, and so I decided to do that rather than just you know, telling you what, what, what I know. And, and so I called upon a master teacher, a woman who teaches Latin at, at Milton Academy, which is a private school, independent school uh, outside of Boston. A wonderful, wonderful school, and and her name is Tasha Otenti, and uh, she uh, is a gifted student. Uh, uh, she's remarkably uh, not only smart but creative and attuned to the needs uh, of the kids. And of course, they're doing distance learning at at Milton, and and so I I asked her, you know, to give me some pointers and observations and. If we could have the first slide. Um, is that first slide coming up? There we go. Uh, that's her name. If you, if you wanted to, if you want to email her afterward and thank her, I think she'd enjoy that. Uh, the second slide. The, can I get the next slide? Uh, it, that's not the next slide, but I'll, 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 you know, the, the, the next slide is, is that kids are suffering from a lack of social and emotional learning. I mean, that's obvious, but it really needs to be said. The, the, the price that we're paying in this pandemic that isn't talked about nearly enough is the psychological price, particularly for kids. Kids need other kids. Uh, they just do. I, I, I call it the other vitamin C, vitamin connect. And when you're denied your, your recommended daily dose of vitamin connect, it's not good for any of us, but it's particularly not good for kids. They get stir crazy, they get antsy, they get impatient, they get restless, they get grumpy, they get irritable, all the things that grownups get, but kids even more. And it's just not good for them. It's just not good for their physical health, not to mention their mental and emotional health. And, and they're suffering uh, because they don't have that. Uh, you know, so, so I hope and pray uh, people will appreciate this and, and do whatever they can do to get the schools opened as soon as possible. But until then, we need to at least recognize th this as an unmet need. Uh, the next slide, please. Uh, if you want to become really knowledgeable about uh, social networks, which is one way that you can begin to try to compensate for the lack of uh, social interaction, uh, the, the Social Institute, you go to the Social Institute, Google the Social Institute, and they have all kinds of education about all the, the, all the social media that you could possibly want to know about. The next slide. The next, uh, and then uh, Tasha was mentioning Wacom boards for teachers. These are the boards that you can use uh, um, and you can have them on, on Zoom uh, that make, uh, make it easy to put things up and take things down. Next slide. The next slide. Uh, another important point, learn how to take breaks. Uh, not just you, but your kids. Uh, 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 you can't just stay in front of a screen indefinitely. If you're playing video games, you can. But if you're going to school, you can't. There's a there's a term called uh, Zoom fatigue, and it's a well known it's a well known fact. I learned it uh, uh, recently that when you're on Zoom, uh, it's more tiring than if you're in person. So, so distance learning introduces more mental fatigue uh, faster. And, and so you want to make sure that the teacher gets this and takes little breaks, little mini breaks, exercise breaks, uh, brain breaks, as my friend John Rady calls them, to let your brain recalibrate, uh, re-equilibrate, um, get up, walk around, do some jumping jacks and come back. I, I think you ought to do it every 20 minutes, but uh, some teachers may think that's too often. 
but you can't just sit there indefinitely. Uh, it'll, it'll, it'll really backfire on you. The, the, next, the next slide. <clears throat> now, it turns out there, <coughs> there are two ways of doing a Zoom uh, learning. One is synchronous, and that just means the, what's going on with the teacher is what the kids see. It's like you're doing a, a Zoom of a classroom. You're, you're, the, you're Zooming the teacher, the teacher's presenting his or her lesson in real time, and the kids are learning it in real time. In other words, the, the, the teaching is synchronous with the kids' lived experience. Uh, like what we're doing right now is synchronous learning. I'm talking, you're watching. I'm sweating, you're watching. <laughs> I'm trying to get accustomed to the heat, you're watching me struggle. It's all done synchronously. We're all uh, participating ensemble together at once. Um, and that is not easy. And that's why it's wonderful that we also have asynchronous learning. Asynchronous learning is where the teacher has prepared a unit of some kind that the student can access whenever they want to. So, so uh, uh, Tasha says she prepares learning tasks. Uh, you know, you could, uh, she's a Latin teacher, so the learning task could be learn the first 10 lines of the Aeneid and how to translate it into English or uh, learn 25 words of vocabulary, uh, whatever. But a learning task, a learning unit that you can access whenever you want to, do it whenever you want to, hand in if there's some uh, proof of participation or test or report or evaluation, whatever, after you've done the, so these are small, they're not big, huge projects at all. They're, they're small contained learning tasks and they're asynchronous. So the, the student can do that alone or in a group that you can put together on, on Zoom, but usually alone. And, and this is uh, in many ways ideal because this is project-based learning. And in my opinion, that's the best kind of learning anyway education ought to be more like that. I mean, that, that's what uh, medical education, you know, the, 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 the project is the patient, the project is the disease, and that's how we doctors learn. It's project-based learning. It's patient-based, project-based, disease-based, and we take it as it comes. Um, each patient, if you will, is a learning task, and uh, it happens to be very, you know, vital and vivid in, in medicine, but you, if you're a if you're a gifted teacher, you can make these learning tasks vivid and, and, and much more so than the synchronous classroom. Um, uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's an advantage of distance learning if the teacher uh, is able to put together worthwhile, interesting, self-contained learning tasks, asynchronous learning tasks. Uh, the next slide, please. A large number of students does not work well for synchronous learning. Now, uh, now um, uh, uh, Tasha ha has, has only like 12 kids in her class. So she can do a synchronous classroom and have it work. But in public schools where you have 20, 25, 30 kids in a class, it's just not, it's just, it just doesn't work well, other than as an assembly kind of thing. So synchronous learning uh, in, a, in a larger classroom is extremely difficult, extremely cumbersome, rather chaotic. People get upset. They can't, uh, they're not taking turns, or, or if they do, you're muting, unmuting. You spend more time figuring out who, who's raising their hand, who's, you know, there's a way to raise your hand in, in Google Classroom. And, and, but it's, it, it's very, it's like playing Jeopardy. Can you click in fast enough? And, that, and Jeopardy only have three contestants. Well, you know, if, if you've got 23, it, it becomes, uh, it becomes uh, a, a lot difficult, a lot more difficult. The next slide, please. <clears throat> Another take home point is, is when you're doing synchronous learning, less content is much better than more. 
don't try to pack in and make sure your teacher doesn't try to pack in, you know, because we have to, we've got so much to cover. My old friend Priscilla Vale used to say, why do teachers talk about covering? I thought the point of education was to uncover, you know, so, so uh, don't worry about covering the material. Less is more. If you can, if you can make one or two points in a, in a class, that's a whole lot better. If they master one or two points, then you cover quote unquote 21 points and they, they just leave confused, upset, frustrated. You know, so, so try to get used to the fact that this is a place where less content is far more teachable, far more adaptable, far more beneficial than trying to cram in. Just because you present content doesn't mean it's being well taught. Presenting is not teaching. You know, teaching is, 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 is motivating, exciting, and then conveying in a way that you can see the student has incorporated it so well that the, could, the student could not repeat it back, because that's parroting, but could demonstrate it back or put it into his or her own words back. That's teaching. And, and you just can't teach a lot of content in a synchronous classroom, uh, uh, particularly uh, distance learning. When it's live and in person, you can get away with more content. But even then, less content is more. I had a teacher in, in medical school, a pathology teacher, which is content, a content rich subject. The textbook is six inches thick. And he would say to us, uh, Horton Johnson was his name. He was a brilliant teacher. He would say, if you can leave each of my lectures with three facts, I will have done my job and you will have done your job. And we're thinking three facts. I thought we're, you know, we're in medical school. We're taking a sip of water from a fire hose. I thought we were get, supposed to get 333 facts. And he said, no, if you can leave each lecture knowing three facts, you, you will do well in this course and you'll become a better doctor. Um, the idea of overwhelming the mind with content, uh, which some people think makes, it, makes, a, makes it a, a rigorous course, that's not rigorous at all. That's, uh, that's slapdash, that's, that's not precise learning and certainly not effective. The next slide, please. Back up, back up. There we go. Uh, once a week synchronous class uh, she uses for weekly check-in so the, the virtue of the synchronous class in her mind is to have a weekly check-in so everyone sees everyone, which in and of itself is good. Just laying eyes upon other students. Remember vitamin C, vitamin connect, knowing they're alive, knowing they're, they're, what they look like, seeing how long their hair has grown. Just seeing them is, is one good reason to have a synchronous class uh, once a week. And then she uses it for games like Kahoot or Quizlet for vocabulary games. Um, now that you can devise your own games, however you want to do, and, and she also sometimes divides them into teams uh, in, in breakout rooms. So there, there are ways, again, of breaking down the synchronous class into smaller components. Uh, but, but I think the check-in part of it is also particularly, particularly good. And, and, and uh, you know, just so that you preserve this vis visual reminder of community, a visual reminder, um, you know, out of sight, out of mind. So you, you don't want them to be out of sight. And that's it, another good reason to have at least once a week a synchronous class. And the next slide, please. Now, what she's able to do, because she's in a private school, an independent school, she, she does one-on-one -on -one Zoom sessions for one of her particularly uh, challenged ADHD students for a half an hour, three times a week. So this boy happens to be a boy gets uh, Tasha for for a full half hour, three times a week. One on one is ideal uh, for teaching, not for social emotional learning, but for teaching, because it's so structured. And for people with ADD, that's what we need. We need structure, and and so having the having that one on one opportunity three times a week for a half hour. More than a half hour is too much, by the way. If you're, if you're working with someone with ADD for more than half an hour, you're gonna lose that person. 
pretty reliably. Um, and so keep it to a half an hour. It's also easier for you, you know, I, I don't see how teachers can do it going on and on for an hour uh, or an hour and a half. But in any case, a half an hour, three times a week and, and short sessions frequently, much better than an hour and a half once a week. Three half hours a week, way better than a, a, an hour and a half once a week. And so this lucky student, um, again, Tasha said she couldn't possibly do it you know, for a whole slew of students, but this particular one, uh, and it works wonders. She's, she's keeping him afloat and, and advancing. Um, the next slide, please. Now, if you do decide to homeschool, and, and I think that is a, uh, essentially you're all homeschooling now, but if you do decide to go the full bore homeschooling, do band together with other homeschoolers. You know, this is in line with sort of my first rule of mental health, which is never worry alone. You know, by, by joining this webinar, you're not worrying alone. You're getting, you know, another point of view. And, and it's, it's really a key to mental stability. Never worry alone. Uh, connect with others. Uh, just the act of connecting, even if it doesn't have any content at all, will, will, will be helpful. So, uh, but band together if you're going to do homeschooling. And, and uh, you know, that's a viable option. Uh, and as I said, you're, you're learning a lot about it now because you can't go to school, although you're using the, the resources of the school, but you get a taste of what it's like. Uh, do it I I as a group and there's, use, use social media to find out who's doing it in your area and, and you, you kind of put together your, your community and, and, and that's a whole lot better way to, to do it if you're gonna do it. And then the next slide, please. And again, if, if collaborative learning is wonderful and it sim simulates life. And there's, this is where mastering social media can be very helpful. And, and as I said, you, you, can, you can go uh, to, that, to that site, the, you know, the, uh, the Social Institute to get tips on how to do it. But Instagram, Snapchat, and, and all those new stuff that, that I haven't mastered, but my kids uh, certainly have. Um, Next slide. This is a, just a, a fact of life in the world of ADD, in, in, in families in general, but in the world of ADD, uh, very often what I call the big struggle develops. If one or more members of a family have ADD, it's, it's it just, it, it's, it's, it's almost like a Newton's law. Um, struggle develops. And as the parent, you want to try to be the one who doesn't feed the struggle. And it's, it's hard because these kids can be amazingly provocative. They can be taunting. They can be uh, difficult. They can be disobedient. They can be incredibly disrespectful. They can know exactly what button to push. They can know exactly you know, what your weak spot is. And, and they can be defiant beyond belief. Punishment only makes it worse. They ab are absolutely immune to punishment, negative reinforcement it works opposite. It's like hammering a nail and have the nail go up instead of down. Um, it, back in the days when kids got physically punished, it, it was completely counterproductive, completely counterproductive. So which, which so don't raise your voice, get into the struggle, go to battle. You can't talk to me like that. If I'd ever talk to my father that way, blah, 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 blah. That is just a colossal, colossal counterproductive uh, intervention. So try to train yourself to lower your voice, sit down, back away, defuse, redirect, reframe, don't get into the struggle. And, and the kids, you know, they, they would rather get you fighting with, with mom, assuming I'm the dad, uh, than do the work, than do their homework. And then if they can get their sister involved, it's even better. And everyone's fighting. It's like going to the movies. And it's entertainment, you see. And so there's a secondary gain in there that you don't want to play into. So watch out for the big struggle and try to catch yourself. When in doubt, say nothing. When in doubt, lower your voice, lower your body, sit down, sit on the floor, back away. Uh, you know, do the opposite of what your rising gorge would, would, would have you do. 
try, try to be uh, the peacemaker, the quiet one, uh, the one who calms the situation down. Don't feed the big struggle. Next slide, please. Understand how easily people with ADHD get frustrated. Now, these days we're all getting frustrated easily, but in, in the world of ADHD, we go from zero to 60. You know, we make a mistake, we don't get what we want, uh, things don't turn out right. We are just on a rampage, attacking, often attacking ourselves, pounding our heads, saying how stupid I am, or attacking someone else, attacking mom, dad, sister, uh, or kicking a door throwing a ball, you know, it, it, it's a frustration intolerance, once again, is one of the hallmarks of this condition. The best thing there is, is sort of to know it and see it for what it is and not say, oh my God, I've got a, I've got a future, you know, felon on my hands or something. Uh, and try to practice preventative maintenance, get a lot of exercise, get enough sleep, uh, try to have a lot of vitamin C, vitamin connection, Connection is the great shock absorbers uh, that, that we have. And don't be surprised when it happens. Try to be the motor oil to absorb the friction. The frustration of learning generates heat. It's, it's hard, it's painful, so you should be the motor oil. Absorb the heat, say, okay, don't worry, we'll get there, we'll slow down, we'll back up, we'll take a break. You know, reassuring noises and moves and words, uh, we'll take care of it. And the next slide, please. As I've said before, understand the, the terrible consequences of the massive vitamin connect deficiency we are all suffering now. Uh, Zoom doesn't do it. Instagram uh, texting doesn't do it. It does somewhat, but there's nothing like in-person connection. We need to be with each other physically, personally. We can't be right now. So, but at least understand that this is the cause of a lot of the malaise that we're seeing. We need each other and we can't have each other, you know? And, and so you, you want to do your best to, to simulate it and social media and all of that are good and, and, in, and, and Zooming is good and uh, getting outside for a walk if you're allowed to do that and seeing other people walking by is good. Um, uh, if you have a dog, I'm going to come to that in a later slide, even better. Um, you know, but, but understand that one of the major reasons people are feeling stressed and not on top of their game is they're not getting enough of vitamin connect. We need to connect. The day will come when we can get back to one another. I think it's just going to be this tremendous outpouring. The first time a stadium can fill up, my gosh, <laughs> it'll be ecstasy, regardless of what team wins. Uh, the next, the first time a movie theater can fill up again. Oh my God, we'll, we'll never enjoy going to the movies as much as when we haven't been able to do it for so long, you know, it'll be this wonderful release and the movie can suck, you know, we'll just be glad to be with each other and in the popcorn line and all the things that we can't do now, you know, and, and so, uh, and that's another thing, you can fantasize about it and that'll feel good too. Just imagine going to the beach, going to the party, going to the movies, going to the game, you know, going to the dance, going to the fair, all the things that we used to take for granted. Uh, you know, we will be able to do them again someday. And, uh, you know, just imagine them and you can get a little dose of vitamin connect that way. Okay, the next slide, please. Yeah, SPIN and SLIDE, two acronyms for what can happen uh, to anybody, but particularly in the world of, of ADD, when you encounter a frustration, a, a moment of rejection, a moment of frustration, a moment of failure, uh, we, people of ADD, can go into spin and slide. Uh, spin stands for the, the, the rejection or the failure uh, creates shame. And then you go from shame to an influx of pessimism and negativity. And then you go from that to isolation, you withdraw, you don't wanna be around people. And then, and then by isolating yourself, you have no creative outlet, no connection outlet. And, and that is just terrible. You, you're worrying alone, you're stewing, in your own you're stewing in your own juice. It's when bad things happen. And slide is sort of the, the cousin to it. 
the moment of rejection or disappointment uh, creates self-attack. You say, I'm a loser, I'm no good, I never could do anything right, everything I make breaks. And then, and then you go to L, life attack, life sucks. I suck, life sucks, the world sucks, everything sucks, life attack. And then, and then that goes to I, imagining the worst. Do you imagine the worst? Do you imagine doom and gloom and bad outcomes and this thing will never end and I'm no good anyway, who cares? And then that leads to D, to dread, a feeling of, you know, just nothing good is going to happen. I just, my life is full of dread. And then that leads to the really dangerous E, escape. That's when people use drugs. That's when people run off on wild escapades. That's when, when people, you know, do things that really get them into trouble. So watch out for spin and slide. And by the way, the antidote to both, connection. Never worry alone. If you see your child going into spin or slide, don't let them isolate. Now, you don't have to hound them, but just go sit with them. Just be there. Bring them a milk and cookies if they're little and, and uh, something else if they're older, you know, and, and, and you know, so, but, but to provide comfort, to provide reassurance, to provide connection, if you're in these negative states of spin and slide. Next, next slide, please. Don't forget to exercise and think of fun ways to do it. Exercise is a great tonic. My friend and colleague, John Rady, wrote a wonderful book called Spark, The Revolutionary New Science of Exercise in the Brain. One of the very best things you can do for yourself is exercise. So if you're in a funk, if you're feeling bad, do 25 jumping jacks. If you're uh, having a bad day, go for a walk. Um, it, it's, it is, it is so good for your body and your brain, even better for your brain than it is for your body. And one of the things you want to watch out for in, in this stay at home world is vegging out too much. Uh, so make sure every day that you, you move your body and, and, uh, and hopefully you can find fun ways of doing it, which simply means it'll bring you back for more. Next slide, please. Here's my dog. It's not my dog, but there's the dog. Dogs are my, you know, those of you who know me know I, I recommend dogs before I prescribe antidepressants, you know. If you have a dog, and I hope you do, walk your dog often. The dogs are the universal creators of connection. If someone says, I don't know how to connect, my first response is get a dog. Everyone can connect with a dog. That's because dogs can connect with everyone. I mean, look at that little doggy's face. You, can't, you just know that doggy. And, and they all have that kind of a face with a little tongue hanging out and ready to go for a walk with you. It's just a wonderful thing and ready to be petted and lick you. And, you know, and even if you don't like to be licked, you, you love it. You know? and, uh, and, and so uh, I remember when I was a kid, we had a big St. Bernard and he would slobber all over us. And as much as we hated the slobber, we, we loved him for it. It, it was, you know, and, and so anyway, if you have a dog, and I hope you do, walk your dog often. The next slide. Okay, here are some do's. Group hugs, if you have people at home other than yourself, group hugs. Uh, people who are, you know, you're allowed to hug, 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 hug. Physical touch, really good. That sense of, of, of physical affirmation, really good. Sing-alongs. If you have a piano, great. If or you know, just you can sing uh, a, a cappello, a cappello. You know, just uh, sing-alongs are fun. Board games and card games, great. Charades, cook, take up cooking. Uh, my uh, daughter made a birthday cake for my wife the other day. It was beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. Or take a take a hobby, something you've been wanting to do. Now with summer coming, maybe you'll take up gardening, or maybe you'll take up. Uh, fishing or maybe, you know, who knows what, what you might want to do, but this is a great time to start a hobby, you know, start something that you can do for the rest of your life. And then the next slide are some don'ts. The next slide, don't isolate yourself. Don't worry alone. Don't pig out, you know, don't use this time to gain 25 pounds. Don't use shopping online as a medication. Don't flame at others and don't become a couch potato. So those, those, those are some don'ts to, to, to watch out for. The next slide. 
remember, this will end. It absolutely will end. This is not going to you know, last forever. It may seem that way at times, but it's not going to. We will get back to a new normal. It, it won't be the same, but it'll be, uh, it'll be a state that we can uh, enjoy, relish life uh, in ways that we haven't been able to. That doesn't mean we can't relish life now, but, but, but our options will expand you know, when the pandemic is over. There'll be more things that we can do that we can't do now. As we wait for that blessed day, be smart, be patient, keep your sense of humor. Oh my gosh, humor is such a great uh, leveler of, of malaise. Get the facts, you know, try not to catastrophize on bits of stray information and don't awfulize life because life really is much better than sometimes you think it is when you're, when you're dwelling on the, the downside of it all. You know, the, the, we are lucky to be alive and to have one another and to have hope, the hope for a better day, which will come, it will come. You know, the woman whose question I, I read at the beginning, uh, it will come, you know, and, and, and you will learn things during this period that you didn't know before. I hope you've learned some of them in, in this presentation. Uh, so this is a time of learning, you know, necessity is the mother of invention. It's the time of discovery. It's the time of learning new skills, new habits, new ways of doing things. I've learned telepsychiatry. I see all my patients now on Zoom. I hardly ever used to do that. Now I see everyone that way. And it's changing the way I, I do my profession. It'll be a lot more convenient for people. They, they won't have to come to see me in my office anymore. So I think, I think these are the, you know, the silver linings that we can find. I, believe me, I'm not Pollyanna. I'm not saying, oh, everything is perfect. It's far from it. It's dismal in many ways. But there, there are some uh, bright sides to it as well. And uh, maybe the brightest side of all is that we can connect with one another and give one another hope. And the next slide. Any questions? <laughs> okay, we do have some questions in our Q&A and I encourage all participants to uh, add any more that you have in the Q&A field. So the first question here, uh, we have, what can parents do during summer to work on cognitive skills that are necessary for complex math problems or essay writing that tax working memory or sequential processing in the context of remote learning where there are a lot more steps involved? See, I wouldn't worry about that, uh, honestly. Uh, I think people are, 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 you know, how am I gonna beef up the brain of my child uh, during the summer? And, you know, I, I think this is a time to kind of relax about all of that and instead do the things you really know how to do. Uh, parents are not good cognitive skill builders. I mean, that's really not in the, the repertoire of your average parent. So I would, instead of trying to learn stuff that is, you know, pretty hard to learn, uh, you know, and, and nobody is doing this exactly the way they're supposed to, I'd fall back on the stuff that, you're, that you are already good at. So have fun with your kids. I mean, if you do that, you're going to be building their brains, believe me. You can build brains just by having a, a loving relationship, by having a game of catch. You're building your brain. You, you, it's not, you know, you know, learning, uh, you know, how to diagram a sentence or solve the quadratic equation or uh, uh, do a bunch of vocabulary, you know, that, that builds cognitive skills. Uh, cognitive skills have a lot to do with, with emotional uh, confidence, ease, ease in the world, ease with your body, ease with others. So, so come to your kids from your strengths. And if you happen to be a, uh, a great teacher, great, you know, take them, teach them what you know about cognitive skills. But I, I think it's asking a parent to twist themselves into a pretzel and that's not what they should be doing. You know, have fun with your kids is my, my first rule of parenting and really my first rule of teaching. Have fun with your students, you know, and, and if you do that, as long as you're not smoking pot with them all day, if, if you do that, you, you will achieve the goal. Uh, you know, it, it, you may not believe it, but plenty of research that shows that that's true. So I, I would not turn this summer into summer school. Uh, and when you get back to regular school, uh, teachers will understand that and they'll make up, you know, for a lost time. 
And I, I think it's a mistake to try to recreate uh, now school the way it was when your kids were going to school. And as Tasha's suggestion showed, this is much more a time for task-based learning, much more a time for project-based learning, much more a time for interviewing your grandparents or, uh, you know, taking up looking in the garden for every insect you can find and finding out what insect it is, you know, that kind of stuff. Projects, rather than, than trying to, you know, build uh, uh, cognitive skills, you know. I'm not sure I even know what those are. But, uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, that that's a really interesting answer, not one that I've heard before. I think a lot of parents are always seeing a countdown clock. We only have this much time and we need to provide as much instruction as we can. Right. Um, there is a follow up to that question. Um, so since you mentioned that the parents shouldn't, shouldn't really be doing this un unless, um, you know, they feel uh, equipped to do it. Would a learning specialist or subject based teacher be better equipped to tutor these skills? Yes, by all means. I mean, if, if you're really hell-bent on doing it, I would farm it out. I would hire someone who, you know, that's what they do, and they know how to do it, and they know how to present it in a way that kids can receive it. Rather than you're trying to turn yourself overnight into a, a, an expert tutor, find someone who's done that, done the homework, done, got, got the skills, gone through the schooling. You know, it, it's not easy to be an effective tutor. And instead of just being making a fool of yourself and having your kid hate you and turning you know, talk about turning on the big struggle, that's a recipe for the big struggle right there. Uh, hire it out, you know, uh, find someone and, you know, pick the target it, make it specific. You know, you need help with uh, uh, with organizing time management, uh, you know, uh, reading, whatever the whatever the problem might happen to be, try to find the tutor who is demonstrated uh, excellence in, in conveying that. Okay, um, we have another question. What would you recommend to educators for supporting children with ADHD who have disengaged from remote learning? Educators who have disengaged from remote learning? No, the, kids the, who the children who have disengaged. Okay, well, if, if they've disengaged, what you have to do is re-engage. And however you do that, um, you know, I think the, the easiest way is to give some, some task, some project that they want to do. In other words, you can't re-engage someone by commanding them to engage. Uh, you know, you have to bait the trap. And, and you, you, you bait it with a project that they want to do. So find something that they want to do. If they want to do nothing, then you need to see a psychiatrist because they're depressed. But, but um, it, you know, you find something that they want to do and then you design a, a project around that. I mean, you can learn a ton by studying anything in detail. I mean, you, you, could, you could study a baseball glove in detail and, and teach a whole course in biology and history and physics and science and, you know, so, you know, so, so try to find, use your imagination and come up with some, something to re-engage them with uh, you and with learning and, uh, you know, detoxify the process. I have a number of patients out there who are in that situation who said, this sucks, I can't do it, I hate it, I'm done. Well, y y you can't flog them into getting involved again. If you try, you'll fail and you'll really damage your relationship. You have to meet them where they are. Now, I'm not saying spoil and coddle, not at all. I'm all about challenging people, but, but people want to take on a challenge in something that they're interested in. I mean, that's how you build confidence is you make progress in a task that, it, you, it, you, it, that is both challenging and you want to do that matters to you. That builds confidence. But if it's neither challenging nor matters to you, it, it ain't going to happen. You know, so, so again, the, the, the art is in finding the topic, the project, the, the line of inquiry, even the venue that the kid can relate to. Maybe the venue is wrong. Maybe they need to do it outside. Maybe they need to do it at night instead of in the day. I mean, switch it up until you get that spark of engagement. And then you've got it made because the engagement begets engagement. 
You know, just like success breeds success, engagement begets engagement and disengagement begets disengagement. So, you know, and, and you can't command engagement. You just can't any more than you can command love. You know, King Lear learned that in the greatest tragedy ever written. And he tried to command love and it blew up in his face, to put it mildly. Um, so, you know, you, you, you have to invite, you have to create, you have to instigate, you have to catalyze, synthesize, use your own personal magic. Everybody's got some magic. Everybody's got uh, some way, some intuition, some savoir faire. Use that and draw out. And it takes patience, believe me. You know, I feel it when I engage, try to engage with a kid who has nothing to say to me, but boo, 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 boo. Drives me crazy. And I want to say, ah! <laughs> but I don't, because I'm, you know, I'm supposed to be a professional. And I, you know, I, I draw upon my patience and my imagination, my sense of humor, and, and see what I can come up with, you know, to get them going. That's really great advice. Um, our, our next question is, how do we apply these tools to deaf and hard of hearing students? Oh, that's out of my league. I, 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 uh, I wish the person I worked with were here, but I, I you know, that's out of my league. I, I don't know. I, I, I have to okay. plead uh, ignorance on that. That's a whole field of its own. So obviously you'd get an expert. Uh, yes, uh, so we'll, we'll follow up with this uh, attendee with a little more information after the webinar. Um, so I think we've already answered this question, how to, make, how to motivate students to do some learning activities. And you mentioned try By to find way, something I, that interests I will them. Give you, um, I'm sorry, I'm sorry I, I will give you one resource. The, the woman I was referring to who works in my New York office is Terry Bacow, B-A-C-O-W. And if you were to contact my New York office and ask them to put you in touch with her, uh, she, she is deaf, hard of hearing, whatever, whatever the term is. And, and she is a very gifted, wonderful therapist and, and she does it and she can explain, she would be a great resource for you. So if you want to contact my office, um, it's a, uh, you can just, go send an email to uh, uh, front desk at hallowellcenter.org and they will put you in touch with Dr. Terry Bacow. Well, we'll be sure to Great. get that information over to the attendee also, right, Namita? We I can okay. get that from Dr. Hallowell. Yes. And we'll get it right to uh, the person who's asking. Okay. Okay. Um, the other, the next question is, how do you get around the difficulty of asking for help in the Zoom era for, for those kids who don't want to stand out in a video conferencing setting? Yeah, it, it's, a, it's a real issue. And, and I think the answer is you ask your question somewhere else. Uh, you know, you can ask it offline. Uh, you can email the teacher directly. You can contrive private ways of doing it. Or you use the forum as a, a chance to learn to overcome your fear. You know, uh, rehearse a question in advance. Uh, ask a question that, you know, you, you know the answer to, you know, so you're not really hanging on tender hooks to get the answer. Um, and, you know, you can use, the, use this as a chance to try to master something that you master a fear. You know, so either, you know, try to get your answer, get, try to get your question answered elsewhere, offline, privately, or use the opportunity as, as a chance to grow, as a chance to get good at something you're bad at. Obviously, I favor option number two, because <laughs> I'm a big believer in trying to grow. Uh, but it's easy for me to say, right? But I'll tell you personally, uh, I used to have an absolute terror of public speaking. I was absolutely, completely phobic of it. And, you know, it's one of the most common fears. And, but I wanted, you know, I'm an I'm a itinerant preacher. I have a message I want to get out there. And so this was back in the, you know, early uh, 1990s. And, and I would have to give my talk with a written text. I'd have to read it. And I'd say to the audience, I'd say, look, I have ADHD and dyslexia. I'm, I, I'm, I've got a 
these two obstacles. And so I need to read my talk to you. And I'd be so nervous, my hands would be trembling. And I couldn't bring the water glass to my mouth because I'd be shaking so much, yet my mouth would be chalk dry. It was, it was pathetic. You know, I had to have a lectern that I would hold on to like, like a life raft. Uh, I'd get through it, but my goodness, what an ordeal. And, and, um, but I just kept doing it. And by continuing to do it, if you've ever seen me give a talk uh, in the last 10 years, no notes, no text. I walk around, I'm spontaneous. I never give the same talk twice. I make it up as I go. It's all ad lib, it's all, but, it, but it's, it's, it's very engaging. I know how to hold an audience. I know how, and it, I didn't read any book about it. I just, I just instinctively learned my way. And now I'm, I think anyone would agree, I'm a really good uh, speaker. And it, it's because I just kept doing it. I didn't give myself the cop out of saying, you know, I can't do this. And, and by continuing to do it, I developed not only an ability, but a super ability. And I, Hugh Jackman came to one of my talks and he said to me afterward, you are a very good performer. And if, if Hugh Jackman liked it, I thought, okay, I, I, I've made the big time now. <laughs> Even better if he sang it. <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, okay, we have a few more questions here. So uh, one of the attendees would like to know, when tutoring on a one-on-one -on -one setting with a smart first grader with ADHD, it has been challenging to engage when he's spinning around in his chair, muting the iPad, fooling around with virtual backgrounds. I literally lost his attention after the first four minutes. And this is playing phonics board games. I create and timed games, which this competitive boy enjoys. What's a learning specialist to do when the child is behind on reading accuracy and fluency, much less writing skills? Well, you're in an awkward position because the best answer is to get him on medication. And, and you know, this is, this is for people who don't quote unquote believe in medication, let them, let them spend a class with this boy. Uh, this boy is being uh, penalized by having his ADHD inadequately treated. And there's only so many different ways the teacher can stand on her head. You know, he is not going to focus unless, unless he gets something that he really wants to do and play a video game or something like that. So you're really walking uphill, uh, you know, and, and so if you could get his parents to get uh, him a trial of medication, that would be by far the uh, quickest and most effective intervention we've got. Believe me, I, medication is not the solution to ADD and anyone who's read my books know that I take a very holistic approach where you want to have a comprehensive treatment plan. But for that little boy spinning in his class and you've lost him after a few minutes, it's, it's just sad because it's hard on the other students, it's hard on the boy and it's hard on the teacher. And there's only so many tricks you can use. I mean, you, you end up having to sort of get through the classroom with him causing minimal disruption and you knowing he's not getting the lesson. He's just not. Uh, now, if you can get him on an independent project, great, but then he's not getting what, you know, he's supposed to be getting. So the, the take home point is that don't be afraid of medication. When the meds work, they are very safe and very effective. Uh, they've been around for 80 years. Not, they're not new. They've stood the test of time. When they're used properly, there should be no side effect other than appetite suppression without weight loss. And, and that is achievable 80% of the time. In my own case, meds don't work for me. They just cause side effects. But all three of my kids have been taking meds since they were in like the third grade and now they're 30, 27 and 24. And they're doing great in life. And you know, they, they, they all take stimulant medication to this day. Believe me, I'm, I'm not a shill for the drug companies at all. But I am telling you, these medications used properly are wonder drugs. They work remarkably well. They should never be the only treatment, not at all. There should always be coaching, education, exercise, vitamin connect, all the other things I mentioned uh, tonight. But to leave medication out, particularly with a little boy like that who is basically screaming, I can't sit still, I can't focus, I can't learn, it, it's, it's, it's just, I think it's just, it's just wrong. You know, people talk about the side effect of medication. What about the side effects of not taking it? 
And that little boy is suffering the side effects of not taking it. Thank you. Um, we have another question. We have not had much online instruction from our public high school, and we are concerned that in the fall, our kid will have a hard time catching up um, versus his gen ed or honors peers due to processing issues. And given that it will be 11th grade, do you have any suggestions on how to get him ready? I would ask the school. Uh, I would ask the school to give you some, pre some preparatory program. In other words, say, you know, he, he, we anticipate he'll be more behind than other kids. First of all, is that true? Because that may not be true. But second of all, if it is true, what can you recommend to us in terms of uh, a tutor, in terms of a curriculum, in terms of, of something? Get guidance from the school, the school that you're going to be going back to, so that you're you you so that you've got a partnership in it, and 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 then you know because they're the experts on this stuff, not you. Uh, so I I would turn to the school right away and 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 try to get some guidance from them that they ought to be very willing and able to give you. And also, if you have, you know, whatever doctor you're using, um, you know, work with, work with your doctor uh, also to make sure you're, you're on the right program for, for treating the ADD, you know, and, and uh, if you want to come see me, I've got an office in New York, I've got an office outside of Boston, and it's all on Zoom, so you don't have to leave home, you know, it's a, uh, and, and, you know, the goal, that I have for my patients, I don't treat disabilities, I unwrap gifts. So I, I want these kids to uh, have their gift unwrapped. And, and it, it is my observation and, 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 and solid belief that both ADHD and dyslexia are markers of talent. You know, it, it, when I see someone who has that, I say, oh, great, not oh, too bad. You know, I know there's many problems that come with it, but the assets can't be bought and can't be taught. And the liabilities can almost always be overcome, can be improved upon. So, you know, so find someone to help you unwrap the gift. I think we're about out of time. And I know I've got to get going. Um, we do have some other questions, but um, we can also send these out via email as well when we send our uh, recording link so we can answer them at a later time. Okay. Yeah, I think we'll try these, uh, these last two questions. We'll try and get answers for you, uh, uh, participants, KB and Brian. So um, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll be following up. Thank you all. Uh, I, I hope you enjoyed it. I can't see you, so I don't know what reactions you're having, but I hope I hope they're uh, nice reactions. And it, you feel free to email me directly if you if you want to. My email address is Dr. Hallowell, dr, no period, dr. Hallowell at gmail.com. By all of our comments, uh, it seems like all of the information you presented tonight it was uh, very helpful. So yes. thank you so much, Dr. Hallowell, for joining us tonight. My pleasure. Take care, you guys. Thank you very much, Dr. Hallowell. Pleasure.